Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ghost Biker Garage. I'm your host, the Ghost Biker. And after a short little break, um, we were going to be on last week, but uh, I was actually investigating at Post Town Elementary with uh, Soul Sisters Paranormal and uh, uh, Sarah from Paranormally Blonde in uh, Post Town and um, at the, at the um, excuse me at the elementary school. And we didn't get back. Uh, I had a, a six hour drive. And so I actually didn't get back in time last week to have my guest on. So we've actually rescheduled her for um, the the end of the month here. So um, so we've had a little break, had a lot going on. We actually did a review last night of our investigation at Post Town. And, you know, that was just really cool because of it being a collaboration investigation and being able to meet up with uh, Sarah, who, you know, we've we've talked to on multiple podcasts. She's been on my show before, but we've not actually been able to meet before or be able to uh, investigate. So that was really cool to, to get to investigate with these two different teams and uh, share different styles and different techniques and really just have a great experience. So if you didn't catch last night's live stream with Paranormally Blonde on their YouTube channel, definitely go check that out. I have a link on my page. Uh, Dr. Sumner and I spoke with the blondes, talked about our investigation at Post Town Elementary School, which was pretty active. And uh, we also talked about our new project, the historic Scott County Jail that will be opening here soon. So I just wanna take a few minutes to say hello to a few people who are here in the chat room. Hello, Dolly, Dr. Sumner, Vicki, Janet, Peppy. Thank you guys so much for tuning in tonight. And as always, if you have any questions for tonight's guest, go ahead, put those in the live stream and we'll pull them up whenever we have a, a break in our conversation. And um, he should be able to answer them for you. Um, I know we've, we've got an extraordinary guest on tonight that I'll get to here in a few minutes. Um, a few other things to cover. The uh, second annual paranormal meet and greet at Franklin, Kentucky at the Old Stone Jail. Two weeks ago was a great success. I wanted to follow up and talk about that briefly last week, but since we didn't have a show, I'm going to mention that this week. Um, we got to meet uh, a lady who is always in the chat room over here, Miss Janet Alm. She came all the way from Arizona and uh, got to meet her in person and um, spend the afternoon having dinner and such. And and it was it was great to get you get to meet you, Janet. Thank you so much for coming out and for all the others that came out to the meet and greet. We, we had a great time and um, it was it was a great success. Had some great speakers. All of the funds went to um, the Franklin County Historical Society or excuse me, the Simpson County Historical Society there in Franklin, Kentucky. So uh, I know that there are some videos circulating from that event as well as some pictures. So again, Thank you, Bill Wilkerson with Whiskey Tango Foxtrot Paranormal Research and the ladies from, from that group for having me out, allowing me to speak and uh, be able to meet with all the great folks that came to that event. Um, another piece of business, um, we did announce the, the grand opening date of the historic Scott County Jail that uh, Dr. Sumner and I are opening. Um, the date is gonna be September 4th, which is Labor Day weekend. So it's fast approaching. Um, we've got a lot of really cool call outs on the website. Uh, I know that um, you guys have just been awesome helping us get the word out about this new location. Um, we've, we've been looking for items for the jail museum. We've been inundated with that, which has been awesome. We're also looking for display cases. So, um, if anyone has any information on, and on any that are for sale, uh, or for donation, please reach out to myself or Dr. Sumner. And then we've also been looking for, um, artists, craftsmen to, uh, put items in our gift shop. And uh, we've had a lot of really talented people reach out on that, that we are um, uh, going to be contacting this week. So we did just acquire a band today for the event. So we'll have more information on that as soon as we can announce that band. Uh, I know uh, a lot of you guys have heard of them and uh, really enjoy them. So we're looking forward to having them play live at the jail. But um just a little bit of information on that. Like I said, check out the website. We are booking paranormal investigations. Now, if you go on and go to the paranormal tab, you can uh, book your investigation and be one of the first people to investigate the historic Scott County Jail. All the information is on there. 
um, and all the available dates that are open for um, uh, the remainder of 2021. And um, we're open for that right now. It will actually be next week. We're open for that even before the grand opening. But once the grand opening hits, we've got a lot of really cool events that are coming up. So anyways, I've kept my guest waiting long enough. And I've kept you guys waiting long enough. Uh, tonight's guest is Preston Dennett. He began investigating UFOs and the paranormal in 1986 when he discovered that his family, friends, and co-workers were having dramatic unexplained encounters. Since then, he's interviewed hundreds of witnesses and investigated a wide variety of paranormal phenomenon. He is a field investigator for the Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON, a ghost hunter, a paranormal researcher, and the author of 27 books and more than 100 articles about UFOs and the paranormal. His articles have appeared in numerous magazines, and he has appeared on various radio and television programs. Preston's research has been presented in the LA Times, the LA Daily News, and the, da and the Dallas Morning News, and other newspapers, and he has taught classes in various, on various paranormal subjects and lectures around the United States. So I'm excited to have him on tonight, and I hope you've got your questions and comments and everything ready, but I want to introduce you to my friend Preston Dennett. Hey! <laughs> I'm Rhonda. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. I'm a little hot, but otherwise good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're out in California, huh? <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've heard you guys are uh, experiencing a really, really bad heat wave right now. Yeah, I need to get a real air conditioner. My, I've got a little <laughs> tiny thing. It just doesn't, it's not cutting the mustard. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would think that would be a must for out there, at least right now. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm, I think I need a real one. <laughs> I've suffered long enough. Well, you know, I, I've just got to tell you, you know, we've got several mutual friends and, uh, you know, I've, I've uh, listened to some of their different podcasts and uh, every one of them, when I told them, you know, that I was going to have you on, they were just so excited about it. And, you know, before I had reached out to you, I had several people that were like, you've got to get Preston on your show. Aww. So thank you so much for taking the time to come out here tonight and, uh, and talk with us. Hey, my pleasure. I mean, sincerely, I love talking about this stuff. I do. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, we've got questions and everything. So, you know, you've been doing this for, for a long time, since since 1986, your bio says. Um, how did you get started? And can you tell us about some of that unexplained phenomenon that uh, you and some of the others that you've talked to have experienced? Yeah, I was really young, actually. I was 21 years old when I got involved. But I was skeptic. I hated <laughs> UFOs. I mean, I didn't just, you know, was I wasn't ambivalent about it. I didn't like them. Mm. Um, I just thought that people who saw them were not thinking clearly. Um, I thought that they were, I hate to say it, stupid. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm really sorry, oh, by the way. <laughs> Please let me apologize. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, cause I was very scientifically minded. I wanted to be a science fiction writer, so I'm all about science. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I loved aliens, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I found that idea fascinating, but I didn't think they were real until something managed to break through my skepticism. And it was a kind of a long process because I was having some unusual experiences. Uh, I mean, my mom had passed away in 1984 and I saw her ghost. Well, I didn't believe it was her ghost. I thought I was losing my mind. Uh, and I had had some instances of precognition, which I couldn't figure out, and have had you know some out of body experiences, and so things were starting to gang up against me. <laughs> and uh, I remember this this evening actually very well. It was November seventeenth, nineteen eighty six. And uh, a pilot had seen a UFO, a pilot over Alaska. I now know all about him. <laughs> Captain Kenju Chirochi uh, was piloting a Japanese uh, commercial jet over Alaska. And he and his whole crew encountered two very large UFOs, bigger than their jet by several magnitudes. And it paced them for many miles. They requested a course change which they were granted, this, these UFOs still followed them, it was on radar. I mean, it was a great case. 
And so this comes on the news and the newscasters are like all very awkward and nervous and kind of making fun of it, really. I mean, they joked, laughed nervously and moved on. It was very tongue in cheek. And I thought to myself, that poor pilot, <laughs> boy, he just doesn't know. He's gotta be misperceiving. Um, he has highway hypnosis. Uh, but my brother, my brother, Mark, God bless him. He saw a UFO um, seven years earlier, maybe eight, uh, and came running to the house. I was just, you know, what, 14 years old or so. And uh, he said, I saw a UFO. And I said, shut up. <laughs> um, I didn't say shut up. You know, I just kind of, like, uh, yeah, right. Um, but now that this pilot had s seen this UFO, I had stupidly i asked mark what he saw um, i don't know why uh, and he described this incredible sighting and by then i was a little more mature to you know listen i guess <laughs> well, that's another thing skeptics don't listen they won't even examine the evidence that's true that's like, true they just won't do it so i'm like listening which was a big step for me <laughs> And uh, he told this incredible story where he had chased a UFO down Reseda Boulevard. And it was close. And it was low. And it was metallic. It had colored lights. It was a big deal. And he had two friends with him. I'm like, wow, you have witnesses who I ended up talking to. <laughs> uh, and uh, that started the ball rolling. I started asking, ev well, not everyone, uh, but I, it, it came up. And I found out I had a lot of friends who had encounters, not just a couple, quite a few. <laughs> it's pretty upsetting. I can't tell you. I mean, when I found out like my friend Sylvia Walters, who was a, you know, a flight instructor, a scuba diver, you know, a neat lady, uh, had an incredible encounter with an egg-shaped object that came over her house. And she had a witness too. I'm like, huh, my sister-in-law saw a UFO over Van Nuys Air Force reserve base here. She had two witnesses with her. And this that started to blow one of my preconceptions, which was that people who see UFOs are alone and they're dumb <laughs> and there's some, you know, out in the country somewhere, you know, no. Um, uh, so this hit home for me. Uh, I heard, started picking up UFO books. I heard a quote from J. Allen Hynek, the father of Project Blue Book. He was the astronomical consultant. And he said, one in 40 people have been taken on board a UFO. And that knocked my socks off. I'm like, mm, no, 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 no. Yeah. That's a lot of people. That would be millions. That would mean, hands down, I know someone who's been on board a UFO. Because I think I know about 40 people. Or back then. I So I said, okay, let's ask everybody. <laughs> And so by this point, I was checking out books. I'm like, oh, my God, this subject is real. It's been studied for decades. There's mountains of evidence. Presidents have seen UFOs. I mean, generals, pilots. There's, been, there's landing trace cases. What? <laughs> um, this floored me. Uh, and, yeah, I found out a lady at work had, had missing time taken on board. Another friend, missing time. Uh, I had a family member, my, one of my sister-in-laws, saw Grays face to face. Wow. Yeah, that's what I said. And she was, she had never read a book on UFOs. She had never heard anyone describe Grays before. It, this wasn't really in the media at all mm -hmm. at that time. So that's how it kind of rolled out for me. Wow. That's interesting. So did you, do you find that it's more um, open and accepted now than, than it was back then um, at that time, whenever, whenever you first started researching? Yeah, for sure. I'm so happy about it. I can't tell you. <laughs> I mean, I really am because I'm like, oh, UFOs are real. And people would look at me like I was a complete nut. And I'm like, no, no, really, really. <laughs> And I would try to explain to them. And I, I could clear a room at a party. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and people gave me this kind of sidelong glance, like, okay, this guy is kind of nutty. 
but then often people come up to me afterwards like, oh, I heard you say this. I had an encounter. I mean, this happened at work. We had a pretty high turnover this office where I've worked for 35 years. I'm still there, actually. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I got a lot of witnesses there. They would be like, oh, you investigate UFOs? This happened to me. <laughs> So they were pretty open about talking about it once they found out, or was it kind of one of those, come here, I want to, I want to tell you something, <laughs> you know, just kind of, I mean, did they, I guess, did they believe or? Yeah, mostly they were very open. Okay. Um, I had the good fortune to work with very unfiltered people. <laughs> 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 they will just let it out, <laughs> <laughs> which I love. You know, I'm kind of that way myself. I'm not, yeah. not, not good at keeping secrets. <laughs> but absolutely, it was difficult in the beginning. Um, often people would say, I've never told anybody. I have not told my spouse. Mm -hmm. Please don't use my name. I will lose my job. Um, and they wouldn't talk unless I absolutely promised anonymity. And sometimes, you know, I was starting to go on the radio and stuff. And even on TV, I was, because uh, the subject is, is really popular on TV and has mm -hmm. been increasingly so. And uh, well, on the radio initially, but they would set up, set you up with a debunker yeah. who would like attack you. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> what did I do? You know, if you're, if you're gonna attack, why aren't you attacking the case? Not me. Right. I mean, what field of science do they attack the investigator? It's just, outlandish to me it's phantasmagorical <laughs> uh, um, so, how, long yeah. did it, how long did it take you to i guess go from being a skeptic you know i know you said you did a lot of research and found a lot of research on it how long did it take you to get from that point to where you were skeptical about it to you know there there must be something to this it was one long painful year <laughs> yeah it was i wasn't happy I, and i mean i'm adore investigating this stuff. It's so fascinating. It's just really, really interesting to me. Uh, but I did not believe and I had to, I mean, it was like having your foundation ripped out from beneath you. It sure. didn't feel good. And I can see why skeptics are like, no, no, go away. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to hear about it because it shifts your worldview. It took a, you know, I'm going to say a year, but I'm, let's, more accurately, it's taken 35 years and counting. <laughs> I'm sure you're always learning something new. I am, yeah. I still get just knocked over and surprised uh, when I find out certain things. Like this, a, a recent book I wrote just actually brought me to tears at one point, which was Schoolyard UFO Encounters. Oh, wow. So this is... You know, you may have heard of a very famous case which took place in Rua, Zimbabwe, where a UFO landed next to a school, an elementary school. It's a really well-known case. It got international headlines. Some 200 kids on the playground, they all saw this object land next to the school and aliens came out and spoke to some of the kids. It's a big, big case. And I'm like, wow, that's kind of interesting. I have a schoolyard case myself. You know, I, I talked to a guy who was abducted from a parochial school in Hawthorne in California as a kid. And, oh. then, and then I remembered, huh, isn't, wasn't there another case of a UFO landing next to a school? And I looked it up. Yeah, there was. Westall High School in Melbourne, Australia. 300 kids saw it, landed next to the school. <laughs> they ran up to it. It took off. And I'm like, I wonder if this is a thing. Because another one was niggling at me. I'm like, yeah, Broadhaven, Wales. I'd heard of this. And I looked it up. Yep, UFOs landed next to Broadhaven Elementary School. Aliens came out. <laughs> I'm like, I wonder if this is a thing. And I started digging deep. And I didn't find a whole lot of accounts and books. But I did find them in the files of UFO organizations like MUFON and New Fork and APRO and others. And I found them especially in, like, I, I was subscribed to the UFO news clipping service for 10 years. And nowadays you can dig up lots of archives. Mm -hmm. And this is when I started to 
like physically shake. I'm like, oh my God. Because I mean, I remember one case just brought tears to my eyes when this little elementary school age kid, seven years old, is describing to her dad about a U UFO sighting in a school in Encinitas, which is not far from where I'm at, Southern California. And the, all the little kids saw it. It was this beautiful globe-shaped object with beautiful colored lights. None of the teachers saw it, uh, but the teachers believed them after, you know, because the kids were like, oh, you know, they're all freaked out. Yeah. But I'm like, wow. And I found a hundred cases. I found a hundred, Miranda, a wow. hundred. Wow. And that's what really shook me up. I'm like, I've been in this field for 30 years and did not know this was a thing. So yeah, I had to write a book about it. <laughs> that's fascinating. So what's your theory as to why uh, this, this is happening? Um, to the elementary school students. Yeah, it's also happening to high school and junior high and college, but mostly elementary. And that got me thinking because over half the cases were elementary school and most of the cases with entities or where they actually landed. Sometimes they would just hover over the school, but it was always daylight. It was always very low. It was long lasting. These were not your average sighting where something just kind of flits by. I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> because there were certain patterns. I'm like, these are, objects are showing off. It became very clear that these were displays, intentional displays where they wanted to be seen. I'm like, okay, why? Because I know, I'm like, okay, they want to be seen. Why, why, why would they do that? Uh, and I'm thinking for a couple of reasons. I mean, one is the obvious to convince people of their presence, of, that they exist, period because uh, that's been very effective. Mm -hmm. And if you really has, if you look at the younger generations, there's pretty much a universal belief mm -hmm. in extraterrestrials. And it's a very clever way to do it because children are very, uh, you know, they have no discrimination against something different. They've never heard the term UFO in most of these cases. They're pretty fearless of something that looks a little different from them. Mm -hmm. um, they soak up knowledge like sponges. Uh, they don't lay over interpretations on what this might be. Mm -hmm. They are ultimately really good witnesses yeah. and, and it affects them profoundly. This is something they remember for, that's what they would always say in these cases. Oh, I think about this every day. So I'm thinking it was to convince them of their presence and I'm like, well, why? You know, because I'm, I'm always going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> Let's see if we can take this one step further. And uh, I'm thinking that they're doing it. The ETs have an agenda to announce their presence because they have a plan at some point to openly have open official contact with us. This is sort of a speculation, but... Mm -hmm. I found something very similar, Miranda. Oh, really? <laughs> that made me figure this. My next book after that turned out to be, and this is so weird, but I'll just go there because this is how it all rolled out. Uh, UFOs over drive-in theaters. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. And, how and I'm going to pull this up because I've actually got uh, your book list pulled up here on your page. So go ahead and, and talk about that. And I'm going to just kind of scroll through. Yeah, it's, it should be there somewhere, unless I forgot it. There oh, there at the it very is. end. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Boy, look at all those books. Man, oh, man. Like I said, impressive, impressive, <laughs> impressive. I'm obsessed. <laughs> um, it's, it's like, somebody stop me. I can't help it. I can't help it. It's so interesting. And I'm having fun. But uh, anyway. I was at work one day and we had a new employee, Claudia Blasios. And uh, you know, I work at a, doing bookkeeping and data, well, it used to be data entry, now I'm the bookkeeper mm -hmm. uh, and personnel clerk and so forth. Uh, and in walks Claudia, she's gonna be one of the medical billers. And uh, she finds out, they introduced me like, here's Preston, he loves UFOs. <laughs> I'm like, oh God. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and uh, Claudia's like, her face lights up. She's like, I saw one. 
And so as soon as I could corner her, I did. And it was easy because she was one of these wonderful people who's just really bright and outgoing and just a delight to talk to. Because some people are shy and they're a little nervous and, you know, not Claudia. I'm like, can I use your name? She's like, of course. Nice. And uh, she was at the Paramount Drive-In Theater in 1972. I'm going to say 70. It could be 71, but I'm pretty sure it's 72. And uh, this is in Southern California. And uh, she was there as a little kid with her sister and her parents in a VW bug and watching the movie. And she noticed that people were running to their cars, dropping their popcorn and their drinks and screeching out of the theater. <laughs> and cause she was just kind of twiddling her fingers there in the back seat. And uh, she looks at her parents and they are entranced. They are almost like hypnotized, staring at something. And so she looks right next to the screen, the movie screen, and there's a giant UFO. Wow. So like, yeah, that's what I said. I'm like, what did it look like? <laughs> and she said it was about half the size of the screen. So that would be 50 feet, you know, big. She said it was below the level of the screen itself. So. I mean, that's, oh, that's low, tw 20 feet up, 50, yeah. Yeah. Uh, bright metallic silver. She said like a shiny silver spoon, colored lights on it was making a whooshing noise, but was otherwise actually really quiet, especially compared to the screaming. <laughs> <laughs> People were screaming and screeching out of the theater. And, and uh, that's all she remembers. And I'm like, well, what happened next? She's like, you know what? Oddly, I don't remember. In fact, we kind of forgot about it. I'm like, what do you mean you forgot about it? She says, we just didn't think about it, didn't talk about it, never even remembered it until one day, some years later, she's now an adult, and she's with her mom in the kitchen, or a teenager at least, young adult, and there's a radio show on talking about UFOs, and a guy comes on and says, I was at the Paramount Theater. <laughs> And this ah. object came down right to the right of the theater and it was shiny silver. And they both turn and look at each other and their mouths drop They're like, oh my God, we were there, weren't we? And Claudia's like, mom, yeah. How come we never talked about it? And her mom's like, I don't know. There is a weird amnesia sometimes involved in some of these cases. Anyway, I'm going on and on about this one case. Um, it turns out, uh, you know, I thought it was a one-off. I'm like, wow, that's an interesting case. You know, wow, I bet that never happened before. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> I was writing UFOs over Colorado and I came upon another case. Same thing. It came right next to the theater, very low, and flashed its lights at the audience, who flashed their lights back, by the way, <laughs> and honked their horns. <laughs> um, and it darts off. And I'm like, doing more research, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's another one. One in Boulder, one in Denver. And I came upon a third and, I'm, and I got a cold chill down my spine. I'm like, oh no, is this a thing? Are they showing up at drive-in theaters? Because you know, I've got a hundred, well, I've got, who am I kidding? I've got 300 books on this subject. And I, had, I read about it in one book, Ryan Sprague's book, Somewhere in the Skies, he has an amazing case. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm like, huh, I wonder if this is a thing. So I dug into the files of research organizations and the news clipping service and just started digging deep. And that's where I found, that's where I got such a shock. <sighs> just like the schoolyard counters, it starts at 1950 and moves onwards. Uh, literally 1950, exactly. Every year, one or two really high quality cases of UFOs over schoolyards and over drive-in theaters. <laughs> and it's the same thing. The only real difference between schoolyards and drive-in theaters is the drive-in theater cases are at night. Uh, they have more people, two, three to 400 people on the average, whereas the schoolyards are 20 to 100, well, 400 in the, some outlying cases. Uh, and they put on a display. They come low. It's a long-lasting sighting. They will flash their lights. They'll send out little objects, little baby UFOs out of the mothership, and they fly around and put on it. Like, you want a show? We'll give you a show. <laughs> I found 100 cases, Miranda, 100. And I'm getting more now that the book's out. 
So oh, here, sure. wow. here again, this is that weird display behavior. It's a very clever way to announce their presence in a way that's not going to cause panic in the streets. Mm -hmm. And I think they're doing it because they want to introduce themselves at some point. So, so you had said something uh, when you were talking about the schoolyards. You said that some of the children had had seen the Greys and and spoken with them. Did they understand? I guess each other. I mean, did um, the children understand the the Greys, or uh, yeah. I guess vice versa? Yeah, these weren't always Greys, by the way. Too, there's okay. different types. Uh, some were Greys. Uh, one lady had a encounter in Mentor, Ohio. Uh, she was 11 years old at a Catholic school, and the UFO came down, and it spoke to her telepathically in English, and said, okay. Re "Remember this day." In the Rua Zimbabwe case, they spoke English there, uh, and so did the ETs. Uh, and they said they gave messages to about 10 students, uh, and they were all along the same theme, which is what they usually will tell people who do get messages. Often ETs will say, don't be afraid, we won't hurt you. That's pretty much their first message to people, which is encouraging. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of fear surrounding the subject, and it's unwarranted. Yes, it can be scary, but they're not here to hurt people. They're not here to take over. Think about it. They've been around for millennia. If they want to take over, they could. Mm -hmm. They're very, very advanced. Um, and it makes total sense that they're that advanced technologically, they'd also be advanced spiritually. Right. So in this Rua Zimbabwe case, the messages they gave were in English, telepathic, and they told one girl, you are getting too technological. There's a good way to use technology and there's a bad way and you could do better. Hmm. And this was actually, I shouldn't say in English really, because according to the witnesses, it was mostly through imagery, which is how they often will talk. Uh, and another girl was given the message that uh, to stop cutting down the forests, and that if we keep cutting down the forests, uh, uh, there, it would cause widespread catastrophe and loss of life. Uh, and it was all along these lines. One was told about pollution. Uh, so these are the, sort of the messages they give uh, through imagery. And I kind of know what that's like, Marana, because I did have my own <laughs> encounter. Yeah. Oh, well, you want to tell us about that? Yeah, I'd love to, uh, because this is so cool. Um, you know, I've been, you know, when I found out UFOs are real, I'm like, wow, you saw this stuff. If I only, if only I could have been there, because I really wanted to see it. That's just the kind of way I am. I'm, I always like to dive into the deep end in anything I do. I mean, if. <laughs> I go overboard a little bit. I'm, I'll admit <laughs> it, and whatever it is. Seeing uh, is believing, though, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so I wanted to see a UFO. I mean, I wanted to see a ghost, and I did. I'm my ghost hunting, and I did. Uh, so ha having the experience yourself is awesome. And uh, I had a couple of experiences. Just real briefly, I'll tell you, the first real good one was where I'm driving along, <laughs> and it's... This was, let me see, late July, 1992. Mm -hmm. I'm driving home through, Cano or well, Woodland Hills to Canoga Park late at night. And a bird swoops down towards my car and I realize instantly, well, that's no bird. <laughs> Maybe it's a firecracker. Cause I'm thinking, you know, it's late July, firecracker. Mm -hmm. Cause it's glowing. And it came right up in front of my car and it clearly wasn't a firecracker. It was this ball of light, <laughs> like a big, well, not, not quite a tennis ball, more like a golf ball, a little bigger. Darts back and forth, back and forth, and goes straight up. I'm like, wow. And I forgot about it. It went left to my mind, completely forgot. Until months later, I'm like, oh my gosh. I remember, I saw a UFO. I think I may have had missing time. Honestly, I really do. At any rate, it wasn't long before I had another encounter. I started having a lot, right? Like, Bam, 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 they were coming at me. And the next really good one, it spoke to me. I could not believe it. I was transcribing an interview with a lady who had been abducted. I don't like that word. It sounds so kidnapped. <laughs> yeah. 
um, which you know some people do have negative encounters. Uh, they have a very strong fear response, and certainly she did. This lady, I'll call her Wendy. She's now very deeply spiritual, super psychic. Oh my God, she's proved it to me, and takes a very positive outlook. This is what often happens. People will start out like, "Oh my gosh, this is scary," and then they're they you know come to terms with it, deal with it, get past the fear barrier, and it's amazing. And this is borne out by other researchers. I'm going off on a tangent. No, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> very interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it can start out very negative and ends up like, no, it's not so bad. So I just want to make that point. And I'm transcribing this interview with Wendy, who had alien hybrid babies. And it was taken up into a UFO or was halfway up and woke up floating over her house some hundred feet in the air <laughs> between her house and the UFO. And the grays were surrounding her. And she was shocked. And she says, put me back. Put me back right now. You have no right. And boy, were the grays shocked. And like, ah, she woke up. And they put her back. They put her back. And another time she woke up and there were grays surrounding her bed. And she screamed, jumps up, and kicks one in the neck. And it goes, snap. And the gray falls down. She now feels horrible. At the time, she was scared. She's like, don't. Don't scare me like that. <laughs> they scared her. Uh, now she's you know, fine with it for the most part. At any rate, I'm transcribing this interview. I'm like, she snapped one in the neck, really? <sighs> and I knew of a, another case like that. And I talked to her face to face. She's since become a wonderful friend. I love her dearly. Uh, and I'm like, but is, is she telling the truth? I, I know she is, but gosh, this is a lot. Uh, I know she believes it. I believe it. This is a lot. I'm just going through this. I'm like leaning back. You know, I, I just transcribed that part where she snapped its neck. <laughs> and I'm leaning back in my chair. And I'm like, hmm. And uh, got this very strong impulse to run to the roof of my condominium. I lived in a three-story condominium complex in Canoga Park. Densely populated. You know, another condo right next to me, a building apartment building across the street, <laughs> uh, a mall just down on, the, I mean, it was populated. Uh, it was late at night, uh, around 11, I guess, and uh, got this really strong impulse to run into the roof of my condo. And I'm like, no, you're not allowed up there. I'm not doing that. Why would I do that? Why, do, why am I even feeling this? Mm -hmm. And it got, it got so strong, I couldn't resist it. And before I even knew what I was doing, I grabbed my glasses because uh, I'm slightly nearsighted and uh, went up. And what's weird, and this, I, you know, I keep my glasses in the car, which is three stories down. I went all the way down, got my glasses out of the car through the locked building, you know, went all the way back up and onto the roof. Why am I doing this? This is what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, I found myself on the roof before I even realized it. Because um, I was trying to resist it. I, I, want, I've, I have tra interview to transcribe. I'm busy. Uh, and so I'm on the roof of my condo, and boom, I'm like, oh, I'm up here. What am I doing? I'm not allowed up here. What? A, this is crazy. And I was up there, not 20 seconds, maybe 10, when, boom, this UFO appears. And it was a bright, orange, fiery globe could have been a disc but mm -hmm. it was pretty big it was across the street i can still see it in my mind it was right above the palm trees so how i how, how high is a palm tree right maybe 50 feet mm -hmm. um, and right across the street which was right across this little la river so uh, 100 200 feet and uh bright this and it was big enough where it must have been at least maybe five feet, but t could have been 10 feet, maybe 20. I don't know, it's hard to say. And it blasted me with this message. <laughs> um, oh my god, that shocked me! It's and it said, not in words, but not even in images, but just a knowing. Mm -hmm. And it said, Hi, <laughs> it's us, we're Wendy's ETs. 
You don't believe, uh -huh. huh? Well, watch this. And again, not in English, but that was the, that was the gist of it. And it was clear enough. I can tell you that I understood. It was hi, it's us. <laughs> We're, we're, the, we're Wendy's ETs. I mean, I knew it was connected to her because they said it. And I mean, it hit me so hard to actually put, I took a step back and fell against the wall there as this thing starts going back and forth, back and forth at tight, acute angles, super high speeds. There's not no way this was a balloon or a shooting star or a helicopter or a plane or... Uh, no one could do this with a a drone there's no way there weren't drones back then not, mm -hmm. um but i'm like wow <laughs> okay i believe you and it disappeared it was pretty quick maybe 20 seconds probably not quite that long but it was pretty long because i mean it darted back and forth a good 10 or 20 times yeah and like paranormal or or anything supernatural 20 seconds is a long time it was and it went down yeah. below the level of the trees i saw that <laughs> so i mean this was at rooftop level at this point so do you believe um these people who have abductions or have a, encounters um why do you believe that that happens to certain people and not everybody is it something does it have to do with your openness does it have to do with i mean could it be something as complex as blood type or genetics or anything is there a certain reason do you believe that certain people have these type of experiences and not others yeah yeah and i've looked into this i will say to preface this that i did talk to a guy in england who's fairly well convinced it happens to way 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 more people than and if not, I mean, he thinks everybody. I am not so sure it's everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, but he says, listen, most people do not remember. And Bud Hopkins said this as well. Uh, he said people can be left with zero memory of it. He found people who had no memory of it. And uh, through a series of coincidences, they agreed to go under hypnosis and boom. Okay. Um, so, and Jay Allen Hynek, like I said earlier, said one in 40 people. So it's a lot. Let me just preface yeah. it with that. Uh, and I looked into it. I'm like, okay, why them? Why not me? Mm -hmm. You know, it's evenly divided between men and women. That's the first thing I did a statistical analysis. I'm like, okay, maybe it's race. Nope. Mm -hmm. I've talked to black people, Asians, Latinx, uh, Pacific Islanders, all races. So that's not it. And that pretty much precludes blood type. Yeah. Uh, because there was a big thing about, oh, you know, RH negative. Mm -hmm. like, mm, I don't think so. I mean, it, that might increase your chances, but no. So I'm just going through this list. I'm like, well, it's not religion. <laughs> Some people are religious and they're not. It's not politics. Mm -hmm. they're, they're pretty much evenly divided, at least in the U.S., between Republicans and Democrats <laughs> with a few independents. <sighs> so I'm like, just going down the list. Like, well, education. Nope. Is it where you live? No, a little bit. If you live in a UFO hotspot, yes, that could increase your chances. If you're driving down a desert road <laughs> late at night, yes, that will increase your chances. If you're outside at night, if you have, and that's where I started to narrow in on this. It's your profession. Cause I'm like, I started running across a lot of night watchmen, police officers, truck drivers. I'm like, okay. Perhaps there's something to this. And that's where it kind of rested for a while. But then, you know, a further statistical analysis made it very clear they do track families. And oh, I'm going okay. to say that half at least of the people who are being taken on board, so have their parents or grandparents or an uncle or and their children. It's tracking families. So there is a genetic component to this uh, for sure. And okay. uh, I think that speaks towards their interest in genetics because they are taking people's genetic material, um, you know, from males and females and producing babies. And uh, there's a whole agenda behind that, which is we've got a really good handle on. We know exactly why they're doing it. They've said they will explain to you if you ask and you're not completely freaking out. <laughs> um, all you have to do is ask and they will tell you. And they've told people, I've got this in my latest book, Wondrous. Boy, she got the, 
they spilled the beans in a way that I've very rarely heard. Uh, and they told her, yeah, what I've heard before, it is too, because our race has become genetically damaged. We once looked like you, uh, but through genetic manipulation and genetic damage from radiation, from space travel, uh, we have lost the ability to reproduce and we are reviving our race using your genetics. So that is one reason. And then I found another reason and this just tickled me. I'm like, oh my gosh, is this true? Because I interviewed this guy, J Jonathan Salter, uh, who was a social worker. I'm like, oh, that's interesting because I had talked to another social worker. And then I talked to another. And then I'm like, hmm, that's like a lot of social workers. And I started looking at people's profession. I'm like, well, a lot of these people are doctors, a lot of teachers too, a lot of environmentalists. Here's an inventor. Here's a police officer. Here's an entertainer, quite a few musicians. And there's a pattern here. These are people who are doing good work for humanity in some capacity. And uh, so no lawyers. <laughs> That's just a joke. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Cause I, I think I did find a lawyer to hear there. Yeah, I did actually, but he was a nice guy. So and, it's interesting. You, you mentioned like some of the messages that they give are sort of, um, uh, social environmental, you know, warnings, if you will. And it's interesting that a lot of the professions that you're mentioning are, are seem to be highly educated people. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say highly educated, but people who are doing good work for humanity in some way, yes. uh, because some are, I mean, one guy I talked to, I'm like, okay, what do you do for a living? He's like, I'm a bus driver. I'm like, Oh, cool. He started telling me really cool bus driving stories because you know, everyone's got stories of job stories. And he's like, but my real passion is I run this website, which is gives people psychic readings and you know, spiritual information. And I'm all about trying to lift people up spiritually. I'm like, oh, here we go. This is the pattern. Mm -hmm. I talked to another lady. She says, please don't use my name. She had grays. She has no history of encounters. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Because most people who are, have that close of an encounter where grays come right up to you, um, have a history, and she didn't. She said Grace came into her bedroom, flipped her around like a rag doll, terrified her, scared the daylights out of her. She's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? They wouldn't answer her. And they held this instrument. They flipped her onto her stomach, put, pressed against her back with this weird cylindrical-like instrument. She felt a buzzing, an energy pulse through her. They stepped back, walked through the wall. The outside lit up like blue light this was that night and flashed out and she ran to the window and everything was normal and she says the weirdest thing was i had injured my back really bad prior to this and i was having all kinds of severe back pain and i couldn't do my job and they cured it they healed me wow. uh, and uh i was super into ufo healing cases because it defied the you know, alien narrative threat that the government is putting mm -hmm. out. It's just not true. They're healing people. This Are there a lot of healing cases? A lot. I got over 300. That's the tip of the iceberg. This is what happens when you're being physically examined, um, probed, so to speak, the old anal probe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, this is true. And I've got, I really looked into it. John Mack, Bud Hopkins, David Jacobs, those are the three leading abduction investigators. All had multiple cases. Barbara Lamb, Dolores Cannon, Yvonne Smith, Edith Fiore said half of her cases involved healings. So don't wow. believe it if someone says they're demonic or they're here to hurt us or take over because the evidence does not show that. Look to the facts, be objective. If this is happening to you and you're like, I hate it, this, I think it's good news for you. Uh, and yeah, I, my heart goes out to you if you're suffering with this, if you have PTSD and nightmares, because some people do go through this. It can be very scary. Uh, but ultimately, they're not trying to hurt people. I don't have accounts of sadism or torture or anything like that. 
They are trying to heal people. That is one of their major agendas. Genetics is another. Waking people up spiritually is another. Warning people is another major agenda. So these are all very encouraging. And uh, yeah, so I'm going back to this lady who, her, whose back was healed. I'm like, what do you do for a living? And she says, oh, I'm a graphic artist. I'm like, ooh, there it is. Lots of artists. And artists mm -hmm. are very helpful to our society. And she says, but really, you know, I'm retired. And the reason I don't want you to use my name is because I'm very active in human rights and animal rights in my country. She's from Norway. I'm like, oh, there it is. There it is, another social rights worker. Look at that. So the ETs are helping people who are helping others because they are trying to wake people up, trying to help people who are doing good work for humanity so they, we can progress spiritually. That's their main concern. We've progressed technologically to the point where we can blow ourselves up, Ugh. but uh, they're worried about that. This is why they're, there when there's anything nuclear. There's a very famous case which took place in Malmstrom in Montana at Malmstrom uh, Air Force Base where we have nuclear missiles. Mm -hmm. And I talked to a witness firsthand. His case is in my book, Wondrous. Uh, this is a very famous case where they shut down the nuclear missiles. All, all of them, almost 20, <laughs> shut them down boy did that upset the mucky mucks they were not happy they took it as a threat when clearly it's not if they wanted to they could have you know blown the place up stolen the missiles left them completely inoperable all they did was shut them down temporarily and the guy i talked to was there he saw it happen he was at the missile site on the ground and saw the UFO hover over the missile, shut it down. It went back online because they have backup. It went back online with the diesel generator. And they shut that down. And then it went back online because if they have batteries, they have double fail safes. And they shut that down. <laughs> so boom, boom, boom. They made sure this shut down. These are all separate systems. Not one is connected to the other for obvious security reasons. So this is very clearly a message. What are you doing with nuclear power? Don't you realize you could destroy yourselves and the planet? This is exactly what they're telling people who are taken on board. And I've talked to other people who've been involved with nuclear weaponry. Whistleblowers have told me firsthand that they were there when a UFO showed up on a guided missile cruiser, nuclear powered, or the USS Klamagor, which had nuclear tipped missiles, a USO showed up. Wow. So, well, and that kind of leads me to how you and I got connected. So we were connected by a mutual friend, uh, Jess Rogie. She recommended that I reach out to you. Um, I had had her on the show and we were talking and there was a lady um, and, and, you know, I don't know what the status of her case is, but I know she was commenting in the chat room um, and she's been pretty open about it. She had a, uh, an, an implant that had shown up or she believed a piece of metal that had shown up on an x-ray and um so jess put me in contact you and then i with you and then i put you in in contact with uh, the lady who had reached out to us right. and that's something that um i found kind of fascinating that i i didn't really know a whole lot about but um they were telling me, you know, that that you've really done a lot of research on some of these cases and have been working with um, doctors that that see some of these x-rays. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. I got to meet Dr. Roger Lear and interview some of his clients. Dr. Roger Lear was really the guy who spearheaded implant removal cases. He removed them from patients and studied them. And boy, was that fascinating because... They were not normal. <laughs> what was really interesting was a lot of them were identical in appearance, looked like kind of little cantaloupe seeds, uh, but okay. they had various appearances. You could see little fibers on some of them. Some were magnetic. They did metallurgy on them and found out that these were very similar to meteorotic iron. Now, how would someone get a little piece of a meteor inside them <laughs> is you know, impossible. Right. So, 
and no entry wound in the majority of these, though some do. Uh, I talked to a lady who had one removed during an incident I investigated actually, and she had it removed by Dr. Lear and uh, sh showed these same unusual properties, no foreign body reaction. Uh, the ETs came back two weeks later and put it back in. <laughs> I Is that a one... common thing that happens? Yeah, I talked to one guy up in the, the Ozarks who had a, this boil appear on his face and his wife joked, she's like, ah, maybe it's an implant. The grays came and, and they said to him, this is ridiculous. I'm quoting now, this is ridiculous. You keep finding these implants. Now we're gonna have to remove it. And, and he said, no, don't worry. You don't have to remove it, I'm fine with it. I didn't know that was an implant, I was just joking. And it's like, no, no, you're gonna, because you brought it up, you're gonna keep thinking about it and at some point you will remove it. We're gonna remove it and we're gonna put it in a place that you won't find it. And they told him this telepathically. Uh, so yeah, he's someone who's gotten to the point where he's had having full on conscious experiences and is able to converse with them. And in my most recent book, Wondrous, uh, this lady contacted me, she's from Indiana. And some years ago, I think it was 2016, she took her 14 year old son a young teenager uh, to the dentist as she does every year or so and uh, got a cleaning and x-rays and these x-rays showed something that none of the other previous x-rays showed which was an object under his back molar and it was large not quite the size of a marble but fairly large i mean not about half the size of his tooth, a quarter size, mm -hmm. and uh, opaque, looks metallic. That's what the dentist diagnosed it immediately as a foreign body and said, when did you shoot yourself in the mouth with the BB gun? And he said, never. And his, you know, they called the mother in and she's like, no, that never happened. And besides, look, it's bigger than a BB, which it was, and there was no entry wound. And there was no adverse reaction. No, was, he was asymptomatic, as they call it. And, and she, they're like, well, what is it? And she just joked. She said, oh, maybe it's an alien implant. And nobody <laughs> laughed. <laughs> the dentist did not think that was funny. <laughs> uh, and so she's like, well, can I have a copy of the x-rays? And they said, sure. And she went back to her previous dentist and found out that this had shown up in the x-ray they took a year earlier and he had kept it from them, uh, mm. kept it secret apparently because it upset him. Uh, but they weren't in x-rays prior to that and they went back a year later and they were still there. Uh, so this is still there and I'm, she sent me the x-rays and I sent them off to a couple of doctors, an emergency physician and a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. And both said the same thing. They said foreign body, metallic, uh, not natural, BB gun. And I'm like, no, no. He would have remembered shooting himself in the mouth with the BB gun. Mm -hmm. That did not happen. There's no entry room. He's asymptomatic. And we're like, well, is there any UFO history? And of course, I asked that question. And mm -hmm. my mother denied it. Uh, he wouldn't talk to me. The kid was quite shy. And he was a young teenager, I can understand. Yeah. And uh, he d denied it to his mother. And I'm like, well, ask him again. When did you last ask him? And, uh, and so he was there when I was on the phone with her. And she's like, and she's like she, I won't say his name, but she, son, <laughs> uh, did, did you ever, have you ever seen a UFO? And, he, and he's like, well, yeah, I guess I did. She's like, what? Why didn't you tell me? She didn't, he didn't want to freak her out. Uh, but yeah, it was like right prior to all of this that he and his friend were walking outside and this UFO was overhead and then it drops down and flashes all these colored lights at them, uh, which is something they don't have to do, by the way. They, don't, they will not be seen if they don't want to be seen. But when they're flashing lights at you, it's like, hi. It's a way for them to introduce themselves. And... Uh, he probably had, you know, was taken. He has no memory of it. 
And so through her, I asked more questions and he had no instances of missing time or anything really, a lot of the stuff, but he did have some of the markers I look for. He's profoundly psychic. On a daily basis, he has precognition and synchronicity and intuition off the charts, intuition and dreams, dreams about Nordic type, ET, well, not, I don't want to use the term Nordic, human looking ETs. Okay. Uh, and by human looking, I mean, they can be any race. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mesoamerican, I've heard, uh, Middle Eastern, blonde, blue eyed, I've heard this entire spectrum, but human looking, and usually like genetically really good looking, <laughs> muscular, handsome, beautiful. And when there's more than one of them, they often look very, very similar. Uh, so that's interesting. And so he has, he's had dreams. And uh, she contacted me after a long, long search. She said she felt like Richard Dreyfus in Close Encounters. She was obsessed and finally didn't want to go there, but there was no other avenue to explain this other than UFOs. And she was su such a neat lady. Oh, I love her so much. She's really just a fun, outgoing, very vivacious person. And they're just sweet as pie. They really, they really touched my heart. Uh, this mother and son do no because they're all kind of alone in the world. She's adopted. Right. She's a single parent, and uh, they have had a, a rough go of it. And then, real quickly to just wrap this up, mm -hmm. she, I asked her, "I'm like, well, what about you?" And she's like, "No, no, I haven't had any UFO encounters. I did have a dream where I saw my son immersed in this gelatinous liquid." I'm like, "Ooh, okay, I've heard this before." And uh, but found out that she did, she does have a few unexplained marks on her body, has had some weird nighttime experiences. It took her a while to sort of admit it mm -hmm. because, you know, it's hard when you come to the realization like aliens are in your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, she calls me up one day. This was an active case that I was investigating. Often it's years after the fact, uh, but this was active. And she calls me up and says, they came. And I'm really happy. I'm like, really? What happened? She says, I woke up. My son had come to sleep in the room with her because uh, sometimes he gets scared and has trouble sleeping. And uh, she woke up and the grays were surrounding her son. And uh, one of them looked right at her. She said it came right up to the doorknob on her bedroom door, short. And uh, are you there? Can you hear me? Oh no, I think we locked up. Shoot. Can you hear me? I am honestly not sure if you can hear me.
I don't know if you can hear me or not. Um, and then your answer is here. So I'm trying to do this from my phone. So let me see if my guest is still here. So odd. I'm going to see if I can get Preston back here. Uh, thank you guys for speaking with us. Um, someone could let you let me know that they uh, I'm going to try to get him back on. Okay. Let's see here. All right. Okay, let's see. Working now. It's letting me buy him. <laughs> Now the screen is dark. Okay. So, well, so this is the <laughs> this is the oddest thing, and uh, I'm sure the audio is a little odd um, for some reason. Just, you know, just going to come on here before we can, and, and I'm not seeing Preston for some reason. His screen is dark. Um, was getting to get to your all questions and the, uh, the internet, it just, it just froze. Ah, I see you. Wow, this is a strange thing. Can you hear me at all, Preston? Up. Oh, wait. Can you hear me at all, Preston? I can hear you. Yeah. Um. This is weird. I'm gonna get it in the stream. And because uh, I can't on the computer, so I'm going to try to end it. And uh, again, thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, I don't know what happened, but we will get Preston back on. Uh, is the audio any better, Preston? Uh, no, it's not great. You keep freezing up. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and end this, but I'll get with Preston here in a few minutes. And um, again, thank you all so much for uh, tuning on, tuning in, and uh, we'll we'll see what, if we can get this worked out because for some reason my internet is is not working. So um, thank you all so much, and we'll we'll talk to you soon. We'll see you uh, next weekend.